for agreeing to talk to us today. I'd like to start by asking you to, to briefly explain what your organization does and why. Okay, thanks for the question, Henry. So uh, the purpose movement is uh, active mainly in three fields, uh, but in, in consulting, in research, and also in investing. But uh, the overall goal of the organization is actually to rethink ownership and to revolutionize how we think about owning companies. The main transition we think is necessary and we are, so to say, advocating for is a transition from what one could call absentee ownership so ownership of companies by people who are actually not really present, people who are just interested in profits, and people who are, in that sense, mere you know, outside shareholders, absentee owners that are sitting in Hong Kong and, 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 and in, interested in the company to maximize the profits. So going from th that pole, so to say, towards what we are calling steward ownership, so an ownership conception where companies are steered and controlled by what, what one could call stewards, P uh, people who feel stewardship towards the mission of the company, towards the company, who might not uh, be you know, able to extract a lot of profits for themselves, but who are, in that sense, mainly owners because they're, they're interested in the company and themselves and uh, itself. So, so that, and that kind of arch transition from, from a more profit-oriented ownership conception, a system that systematically, well, pushes companies, even if you're um, incorporating things like, you know, B Corp, et cetera, into your charter, even, even though, you know, the system is, because you're, you're selling the, um, the majority um, of the, like the, the steering wheel on the market, it pushes the companies always towards, towards the direction where, um, yeah, profit maximization um, or money is in this is the the key the key KPI, and um, uh, and s somehow you know restructuring that and and changing the power dynamics themselves uh, towards something like foundation ownership or trust ownership, you know, or models like John Lewis in the UK, uh, where people are co-owners as long as they're actually there, as long as they're working for it. And that's uh, a little bit what, what we're trying to do with, with different, like in different fields. We're investing in companies that are, that are transformed to steward ownership. We're helping, helping in these transformation um, times by consulting, but also by, for example, buying out non-aligned investors um, or by providing alternative liquidity to founders um, who say, you know, I've built this great company. I could sell us to the, to the Chinese for, you know, I don't know, an absurd amount of money, but I, uh, I don't feel that is, so to say, good for my company, but still I need a pension, you know, my, my company is my pension. So can you give alternative liquidity that might be not the market price that you would get if you sell to the Chinese, still somehow restructure the company in a way that it stays independent and mission-driven in a very long term? So can I ask you then, presumably, a founder or uh, the, the, the owner, the steward owner of the company mm. could also have a mission to maximize profit. And also people outside the, the, the company, people affected by the company, uh, the stakeholders also presumably have an interest, the suppliers, but also maybe people who are living in the environment that could be affected by the company. Don't they also have an interest in the stewardship of the company? Why should we rely on this founder to be somehow like a sort of medieval, uh, paternalistic uh, sort mm -hmm. of person? I mean, yeah. is yeah. that right in today's world? No, we, I, I think that that is um, maybe a little bit, uh, I maybe expressed, expressed myself a little bit the wrong way. Um, we're, we're not proposing to rely, you know, on the founder and, and have a paternalistic person there. Um, we're just pushing for um, an ownership conception that is, that is, so to say, putting these people in control that are most affected by the decisions. So 
and these are mostly people who are investing their lives into the company, you know, who, who really marry <laughs> the company to a certain extent. This can be the founder, this can be, you know, other people, other entrepreneurs. And this can be, this can be also other, um, this can be also other stakeholders. So for example, one company uh, that we're currently helping to, um, and in, in which we all uh, probably invest as well, OGC, organically grown company in the U.S., that's a large organic wholesaler. They want to stay independent and still they want to be self-determined, not determined by absentee owners, not determined, you know, by far away shareholders. So uh, what are they setting up now? They're setting up a so-called perpetual purpose trust. That is a trust that doesn't have beneficiaries. And that is maybe very important. You know, profits are reinvested, donated, or, and that's the other thing, um, distributed to the stakeholders. It, it, it doesn't have such a beneficiaries. And the second thing, it lives um, forever. And why is it self-determined? Because there's a very clear de definition who can steer this trust. There's a stakeholder group of employees, suppliers, mainly employees and suppliers and suppliers are only so to say in the stakeholder group if they if they are farmers who who supply more than i think we're selling more than 20 percent or something like this of their of their crops to 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 that company if they do so they're included in the stakeholder group and they're able to vote for the trust protector com committee so that's just an example so how how you can also include stakeholders but also, I think John Lewis is a nice example that, that shows you don't have to, that there's no black and white. You don't have to do like either you know, a total democracy of stakeholders or patriarchy, uh, the, this, this patron, this, this founder who has total power. In the case of John Lewis, you have this nice balance of a CEO who is actually head of the trust and owns quite a lot of uh, John Lewis, but all, only as a steward. He cannot sell. He cannot take out profits with his controlling shares. There are different shares, share categories. And there are the, the, all the partners, all the employees who could potentially fire him, but they cannot freely select a new one. They, they have a very interesting combination of merit and democracy and I think you know in, in steward ownership settings you often see that kind of combinations but steward ownership maybe maybe you know, I think that the main new thing um, about steward ownership is just the attitudes toward ownership uh, towards ownership it's not anymore okay I own wealth and as an owner I'm a wealth holder, a holder and I want more from myself no ownership in the stewardship sense is more understood as a as a task as as you know, I'm holding a responsibility to do something here with this company. I'm, I'm a steward and I cannot sell that. That, that kind of task, obviously, you know, is not, is not a speculative commodity. While wealth, while, while um, you know, bonds that I have in the company or so might be, you know, normal, you know, sellable on the market, etc. That's not, that's not the case with, uh, with steward ownership. And that's what, why we see a lot of legal structures like foundations, charitable foundations owning companies or, or trusts or employee ownership trusts or so that are trying to, to do basically what steward ownership does. And maybe, maybe uh, what's important, there are hundreds of forms how to legally implement steward ownership, really. You know, you, Bosch, the technology company, has found a quite interesting form. John Lewis has found a form. Others have OGC, etc. I, I could name you um, hundreds of them, um, but they all share two things, and that's why we call them steward-owned. One, self-determination. So that means the control, the steering wheel, lies in hands of people who are somehow connected to the company, to the mission. And second, purpose. Uh, these companies perceive themselves as, as following and then, a certain mission and purpose and seeing profit as a means to an end and not an end in itself. You know, they reinvest a lot and, and they never perceive um, profits as the end itself. And why is that so? And maybe that answers your first question. You know, why founders could also have uh, max maximizing profits as their mission. That was your yeah. first question. So the thing is, that that won't happen why because if you have that mission you won't choose a legal structure that's steward owned because that will <laughs> that will prevent you from doing that because if you're a steward owner as i said your company um, doesn't become a speculative commodity majority of the company the majority of the voting rights um, is not sellable anymore it always has to rest in hands of stewards so you are you're not actually able to maximize your return 
um, as you would be able in, in other legal forms. So that's why we are seeing, so say, a very natural selection process there. So I just to put the sort of devil's advocate, if you like, that Go ahead, I suppose yeah. the hedge fund managers and people like that would say, well, you know, we see companies that are run by managers without any sort of accountability, if you like, to the market, and they become flaccid. They don't innovate. And so we fund managers, uh, we hedge managers, fund managers come and actually force them to be more efficient and innovate and change. And what you're suggesting is creating an economy which will not innovate, will, will just feather its own bed and, uh, uh, and not actually deliver value for people. No, um, I, I hear this um, from hedge fund managers a lot. One even said, you know, a company that won't need to sell or startups that don't do an exit and no exit startup economy is a no innovation startup economy. I think that is just so totally wrong <laughs> and i explain you why first uh, you have to look at the innovate like the innovation fitness of the companies these hedge fund managers are talking about so normal companies that are in the capital markets how innovative are they actually and there are nice studies one um, which is which i could uh, cite is done by mckinsey <clears throat> they asked the cfos of all the top SP 500 companies in the US and they asked them, dear CFO, you could do a very good investment that would yield a lot of returns in the long-term future to your company, but your quarterly numbers wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to meet them anymore. This quarter, you would be probably slightly down. Um, would you do that? So guess how many would do it? 90% wouldn't do it because there's so much fo focused on, on the quarter. So we're living you know, in a world of quarter capitalism. We're, I think the argument that, <laughs> um, that investors are particularly good to push managers to innovation is just so totally wrong. Um, it couldn't be more wrong because what the capital markets are doing, they're pushing CEOs to short-termism, short-termism, short-termism. We have, if you're like the average, the average uh, number of days <laughs> or months, a CEO is in office in a capital market, uh, like in a public company. Is I don't know. It's something like two years or less, one and a half years. In steward-owned companies, that's much higher. Take, for example, Bosch. In 130 years, they had seven CEOs in 130 years. And now the question is, does that make them more innovative or not? It does make them quite innovative. Why? Because they can think in a very um, long term. So already 20 years ago, the CEO back then, Franz Fehrenbach, said, you know, we're going to invest heavily into e-mobility and environmental technologies. Why? Because we think in the long term that will really um, be important for the world and also for Bosch. All our competitors aren't doing it now because they have shareholders in their backs that, that won't allow them. But we have the responsibility as a company that is not that doesn't have any excuses, you know, why you're, why you're uh, not doing the right thing. We have, to, we have the responsibility and we're doing it. That's why, you know, Bosch still is one of the most innovative companies on the world in, in the technology space or take Zeiss or take other um, world market leaders in technologies that are steward owned and are very innovative. And here comes a, uh, another maybe more important argument. In one of the most innovative cities of the world, San Francisco, um, Elon Musk, the Tesla founder, and Sam Altman, the um, boss of the largest um, and, and most successful uh, incubator of the world, um, Y Combinator, they started an initiative called OpenAI. And, and the, what they wanted to do is like create artificial intelligence technology that is open. And that, what, that's a super innovative thing. You need the best programmers of the world um, to do that. So how did they try to attract this talent? They knew they couldn't compete with Google, with Amazon, with Facebook, who would pay these people millions a year. So they said, okay, we have to do it, basically steward owned from the very beginning in a nonprofit way. And that's, and we say, you know, everybody gets, you know, a certain salary, but not higher. Everything what you do, you're not doing to maximize somebody else's wealth, but you're maximizing the purpose here. And they got really good people 
people from Oxford, you know, quit their job at the faculty and came there, etc. So that's just an interesting thing. And that's the same thing with Bosch, for example. You know, if, if you are an engineer and if you have a great idea at Google, what do you do? You quit your job and you, you start your own company. Why do you want to make Larry Page more rich? You know, he's rich enough. What do you do if you are at Bosch? You're not quitting your job. You're staying in because you know all the profits from Bosch are either reinvested or donated uh, to the public or, you know, used to pay back a certain uh, interest to the bondholders because Bosch has also um, issued a lot of bonds. But these, uh, these people don't have a capped return. They don't get everything that really the most part is reinvested. So these people know that, know that very well. Um, and, and they get a lot of freedom inside of Bosch because Bosch knows, you know, we, 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 we must make sure they have like the same, the same freedom other startup entrepreneurs have. They can live wherever they want, etc. They have total freedom, but, uh, and they know they can, they can stay in. They're not maximizing somebody else's wealth. And so that is a very, I think if you're, if you're looking into a world history, most, innovators weren't driven by money most big innovations came out of passion and and chance luck uh, or 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 other or, or like you know or play games etc so um and this is this is i think the steward ownership provides really a good framework for these innovators um to to stay at these companies now, i suppose the model often is, isn't it, that the initial entrepreneur uh, starts up the company, they get it going, and then, of course, at one point, they use an IPO to sell up and make yeah. millions or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, that's the, that's the model. Is that changing, do you think? Uh, are people no longer wanting to do that? Do you see a, a, a people moving more towards this steward ownership model or, or, or not? Or is this still the, 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 the fringe? I think it's uh, becoming more a mainstream. One example is Perry Chen, the founder of Kickstarter, who said from the very beginning, I won't do an exit, I won't do an IPO, because I think that will put pressure on the mission of my company. I don't want this. I perceive my company as, some, as something like a public utility I don't want. I don't want uh, capital markets to decide here. And, or take the owner of Whole Foods, the largest you know, organic supermarket chain in the US. They went public, but this, this pressure on the capital markets was, was so challenging for him that he phoned uh, Jeff Bezos and asked, you know, can you take us private again? The only big company that was able to do that was Amazon. Of course, that's, that's a very you know, dangerous marriage. And uh, I think we've got to see that this was actually a very bad decision. But that's another, that's another topic. He was still, you know, looking to become private again. I think more, more people are understanding this and the trends, the general trends are um, showing that there are less, um, less public companies today than 20 years before. We, we have a, um, a very clear decline in, in public um, companies. But private finance is also you know, not necessarily a good thing, isn't it? Uh, I mean, the classic sort of breaking up, sweating assets, maximizing exactly. returns. Uh, yeah. They're no yeah, they're, better than the markets in many ways. Yeah, yeah. no, the, the classic uh, private equity... Private equity can be also quite brutal. Uh, you're, you're totally right. And that's why also a lot of, of these Mittelstand um, companies are also not really happy with, with, with that. And, and they are, that, that's the thing. I'm, I'm seeing they are in a... They don't have alternatives. That's at, at the moment a problem. That's why I think um, you know, we need to rethink the ownership structures. Because most people are thinking, okay, you know, I could sell to the uh, public market. I could sell to private equity. I could sell to a large other company, but there's no other way. And we're, especially in the startup world, we're financing companies in a way that requires these kinds of liqu uh, liquidity events, sell or IPO. And I think we need to rethink how we finance them actually in a way that this is not required. And there's, a, there's an entire movement around this that's called the Zebra Movement in the US that... Um, that say, you know, we don't want to create unicorns that try to become monopolies. We want to create zebras, 
because zebras there are a lot of zebras. Are, <laughs> a lot of zebras, exactly, because unicorns are very seldom, and if you see them, it's only one. Uh, but zebras, it's always you know, many. It's a big group. They're very social. Um, it's a very different animal. So they want, want they want to create this kind of different animal. It's a, it's a movement. It was a few women um, wrote the zebra manifesto and it took off thousands of people uh, signed it on and, and, and supported so that that um, somehow shows that there is a big need um, for for that kind of rethinking As, yes the question is of course you go to the market or you go to a private I investor um, to, to get money you need money so these the zebra phenomenal that are these investors who are willing to take totally different relationships and who who are they and why yeah i think these are investors who are um who are looking a little bit more um long like with a long-term lens on the company um investors who are um not so much you know pursuing the, the the putting piles of money on the company and making sure either it wins everything or we have to close it down it, it loses everything but rather have you know investing in companies that are that are less risky but that also need to create less of a return because if you are changing your risk return profile from from the you know in the in the in the normal yeah <laughs> on the, in, the, in, the, in the crazy startup world you have this risk return profile maybe ten percent survive and they obviously have to make a lot of a lot of return to to pay back all the losses you made with the other startup so if you are changing this a li this little bit because you're not pushing companies to win everything but you know they can be also just a normal company that makes profits and that has a um, important aim and important mission you know that then um, you're uh, you're changing the risk profile and you you can accept lower returns and then this model um, works quite well yeah there are, there are investors who are doing this but you are you're are right there's still a long way to go and several investors um, need to need to understand this uh, much more but there are already vcs and uh and other um, also early stage investors who, who get this. One might be, for example, Indie VC, a, a venture capital firm in the US who primarily um, invests in that kind of companies. Or what we're doing, Purpose Ventures. Purpose Ventures is also investing in <clears throat> these kind of uh, companies. And I could name you some others. So that is, there, there is this movement. And the interesting thing is a lot of family office, a lot of business angels are understanding this quite well. And the, the, in, the big institutional VCs, they might have it, you know, for, for them it's a little bit more difficult, but there is a, there's a growing network of, of people, also of impact investors, who are absolutely understanding that this is key, the, the question of what kind of approach does the startup take. And, and then the other thing, what we're also seeing is, of course, uh, crowd investing uh, is another very interesting form to finance these startups. We just helped a small startup in Finland to raise 1.1 million um, with some investment from us and some through the crowd, actually quite a lot through the crowd. And uh, that was a very successful um, campaign and people loved it and people loved and that it was steward owned because they really knew, you know, we're not helping the founders to get like filthy, filthy rich, but we're helping them to, to actually create something very valuable for the world. Well, that's great. Uh, and um, thank you very much uh, for talking to us. Uh, I think this sort of direction towards purpose led, towards thinking that corporations actually providing value to the world, to the common good is obviously crucial. And, uh, and uh, I'm really glad that uh, uh, your company is, is trying to uh, promote this. And thanks very much for talking to us today. Thanks, Henry.